going to look at is just the basic schemes, of the overarching schemes first. And if you would, go with me to Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And um, we'll see in this passage of Scripture, 12, 12, 9 and 10, we'll see two, two types of, of schemes of the devil. What he tries to manipulate and maneuver himself into. Uh, Josh, while you're at it, start with this. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth. So that there's his first. So Satan is a what? Deceiver. Deceiver. I before you except after C, right? So first thing is going to deal with is deception, the spirit of deception, which Satan uh, can deal with, uh, can cause issues. Um, I think I've told you all this, but I want to say this. I'm going to repeat it. Do not underestimate the power of Satan's ability to deceive any one of us here. Uh, just a crack doorway can really open up serious um, aspects of deception. Uh, look at look at what would it take for what would it take for for me to fall prey to a spirit of deception. Look at first Timothy chapter four verse one. And it's it tells us one of the simple ways how it can happen. We're not going to go in depth to the deception, but it's just enough to just tell you what can open the doorway of it. Yeah. But the Holy Spirit explicitly and unmistakably declares that in later times some will turn away from the faith, paying attention instead to deceitful and seductive spirits and doctrines of demons. We will fall away from the faith. How? How, how do you start to fall prey to a deceiving spirit? It tells you in this verse. Pay attention to it. Pay attention to it. I mean, I'll never forget one time I was there was a, some people that I knew that um, were getting ready to be baptized into the Mormon church. And uh, they, uh, so anyway, I, I called them and was talking to them about it. And, you know, and, and come to find out, they, they were going to get baptized. It was like on a Tuesday or something, or like on a Monday that I was talking to them. That Saturday, they were scheduled to get baptized in the Mormon church. The Mormon elders were going to come over on like maybe on Wednesday or something like that to go through finalized stuff with them. And, and after I got talking to them about it and about the, the power of deception, and particularly in relationship to Mormonism, uh, they uh, they said, well, "Will you come? Will you come Wednesday night when the, when the Mormon elders come?" And I said, "Sure, sure." So I started. Uh, so I started, you know, you go, okay, I'm going to be talking to these guys. And so my first step was, I, there was a book uh, that was real famous back in the 70s and 80s and 90s, a guy by the name of Walter Martin, and called The Kingdom of the Cults. He goes through all the different cults that was in, in effect during that time. And he went through Mormonism. So I, so I got that book and I started reading about Mormonism. And all of a sudden, I feel, the more I read, the more I felt slimed. And then I felt the Spirit of God saying, you're doing the wrong thing. Doing the wrong thing. And then, then I just, and then that night, I'm, I'm driving to go meet him. And, and the Lord spoke to me real loud. He says, you know, don't take anything in with you. Don't even take your Bible. Just go in. Just go and meet with him. You know, just like in dealing with, uh, you know, counterfeit money. You don't train people to find counterfeit money by looking at counterfeit money. You train people 
to discover counterfeit money by training them what the real stuff looks like. Because why? Every counterfeit bill, just about every counterfeit bill, will look different. So you try to look for one thing, and another one looks different. So if you know what's for the real thing, is you can tell what's, what's counterfeit. So anyway, I'll never forget that night. So I just go into that time, and just the Spirit of God just starts bringing things up. And it was really cool as as we're speaking how the, the really the couple, the truth starts manifesting in their heart. And they start nailing the Mormon elders. And they, after about an hour or so with the elder Mormon elders looking, they go, well, I see that we're of no value here. And they got up and walked out. And the couple, you know, just really got set free. The power of deception is really, really powerful. And all you have to do is pay attention to it. And that's how, that's how, like, you, like, just pay, oh, I want to find out what Mormonism has to say. Well, you pay attention to it, you open yourself up to that spirit of deception. And so, just to be very, very careful in that. So, deception. Uh, let me also, let me tell you this about it. Uh, a couple of things about deception. Uh, the spirit of deception is not on so much on, like a person who has a spirit of deception, it's not so much in the person speaking it. I may have already told you this before. But it's in them being deceived. It's like if somebody's got a spirit of deception, they would see that wall and they would, they, they would tell me, oh, that wall's blue. And so the temptation is you think, well, they're trying to deceive me in relationship to that wall's blue. No, the reality is they see the wall and they're seeing it blue. And that's why they can be so powerful in their deception in it. Now, another thing that I want to tell you about deception, and this is really advanced, what I'm about to tell you, but I'm just telling you about it. Sometime when you start casting spirits out of people, multiple, when they have multiple different types of demonic spirits manifesting, there's a thing that would we use this term called a gatekeeper spirit. And so what will happen is, is in, a, in the spirit of deception many times can be that gatekeeper. So what has happened is it's letting in these all other kind of types of spirits. And so what will happen is like spirit of lust or anger or homosexuality or whatever. And so you start chasing these other spirits and trying to get rid of them, but really the reality is the root of all of it is deception. And it's what's letting everything in. And you, you think you're getting the person free, but no sooner do you get it out, the, this deception is going to open the doorway for it to come back. And, I, you know, it don't make, may not make sense to you right now, but if you get into a situation and you're casting spirits out of somebody and things are really confusing, it very well may be dealing with something that's this gatekeeper spirit thing. And I've run into it a number of times. And it it's, it's can be interesting. So you, what has happened is you have to back up and you deal with the deception. And then you can deal with all this other peripheral stuff that will look like the main problem that's going on. So, uh, uh, like, like, like homosexuality, you know, that can, you go, okay, well, they have to monitor homosexuality. Well, no, then maybe it's, they're dealing with deception. It's the spirit of deception that's letting that in. Because they're deceived in relationship to who they are. Is that not always the case? Okay, what do you mean? Like, if somebody who is struggling with same sex, sex attraction, they are prob they probably deceive thinking that's okay. Well, that, okay, what I'm trying to say is some situations, like homosexuality, the root is they've been sexually abused. Now, it causes a deception. The deception is not the root. The abuse or the unforgiveness or something like that is the, is the root. But sometimes what happens is, particularly in our society today, it can really happen because everything is, you know, trans, bisexual, transsexual, polysexual, you know, multisexual, you know, whatever sexual, you know. 
And so, and there's so much deception out there. So that's the root. So you just start paying attention to it, and it just gets it, and then it opens us other doorways of other stuff. So, yeah, that would be what I just said to you. Be a good example of one. You're trying to deal with the homosexuality, and you're not going to get anywhere with it. You're going to you're going to have to deal with this deception and the root of it. So deception is one of the schemes of the enemy. Let's go to a, let's, look, let's go to another one, um, a t- another type of uh, spiritual warfare attack of the enemy. Oh, you're in Revelation 12:10. That's where we were at. Um, let's go back there. We'll start at nine and keep reading again. Right, you got the mic, so you you inherited. It. Yeah, read 12, nine, and ten. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And I heard a loud voice in the heavens say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Accusation is another scheme of the enemy. This one's really interesting. Uh, and I'd, it'd be in, interesting. It, this would, we could go into this this one right here. I just said a while ago about how deep we want to go. We could spend two. We could spend two Wednesday nights on this. But let me just show you how some ways that accusation works. Um, look at. Uh, we could just go to the book of Daniel, chap, Daniel chapter nine. I mean chapter seven, verse twenty-five. Accusation it means to declare a charge against, to judge. Start at verse 24, where it's talking about the Antichrist. It's a pro- prophecy regarding the Antichrist in the last days. Chapter 7, verse 24 and 25. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise. Different from the earlier ones, he will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hand for a time, times and a half. Three and a half years. Times and a half. Now, let's come at the Antichrist. It's interesting. I want you to catch this stuff. And, and let me just say this, y'all. Uh, this is one of the other things that we can go into details about. In this, in the, in the last days, there. There are, there are a number of different dominating demonic spirits that are that are really at work. Spirit of Jezebel, spirit of Ahab, spirit of Absalom, unbelief or apostasy. Really, it's the spirit of apostasy. One of the really the big ones is is the spirit of Antichrist, and it talks about interesting in the Book of Revelations that the Antichrist, the, the Antichrist was, is not, and is about to come. See, Jesus, he was, he is, and he is to come. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He never ceases to exist. The spirit of Antichrist was, it operated. It manifested like in Abomination and Desolation with Daniel, when, where the temple was defiled in, in um, AD 70 and also before that. Hitler was the spirit of Antichrist. You could go into uh, Islam, Islamic countries, and I go in there. The spirit of Antichrist is very, very strong. You can see this in the book of John. It is already at work. The spirit of Antichrist is already at work. Well, it is at work in our society. And here's the interesting thing. I want you to watch this. Is This is about the spirit of Antichrist. This is the Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist. And it's relevant for us, even in this season, this time, even though the physical Antichrist has not yet been manifested. But the spirit of Antichrist is at work. And notice what it does. He will speak out against the Most High God. That's accusation. Now, he will accuse the Most High God. Are you saying in the courtroom of, am I saying in the courtroom of heaven that this demonic spirit will stand up before the Most High God and accuse him? No. 
And I could show you things in this passage of scripture here where when the Ancient of Days takes a seed, it's, it's like, no, Satan don't do that. He don't accuse God before God. But it, notice what it says here. It says, he will speak out against the Most High God and wear down the saints of the Most High. Wear down the saints of the Most High. Wear down the saints of the Most High. Grow weak. What is a Christian's strength? When a person believes, what's the emotional signal of faith? That's, that's the object of our faith. The emotional signal of faith. Peace is an emotional signal of right relationship. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with every man. Uh, peace on earth, goodwill with men whom men are well pleased. So peace will signal right relationships. It's joy. So the joy of the Lord is our what? So the joy of the Lord is our strength. The spiritual emotion of faith is joy. They fill us with joy and peace in believing. Uh, Psalm 33, 18, I believe it is. Our heart rejoices in Him because we trust in His holy name. Okay, so he'll wear down the saints. So he's wearing them down. So he's stealing their what? Their joy, which, and how he steals their joy is stealing their faith. He's stealing their strength. But, but what, how's he doing this? And notice what the first statement is. He will speak out against the Most High God. Guess what? He's not speaking out. He's not, he is not speaking out against the Most High God face to face. Guess who's speaking out against the Most High God is? We are. Like, God's, God, God's, God's, He ain't going to do it for me. You just made an accusation against God. Uh, I have pastor, God, God don't like me. He loves me, but He don't like me. You know, um, he's not, God's not going to work on my behalf. So guess what? You've just made accusation against God. And so, GD is the ultimate accusation. What you're saying is God is the damner. God's not the damner. God does not condemn people. He's not the condemner. Satan is the condemner. First, first Timothy chapter 3 tells us that in you know, incur condom thirty eight or something like that. So so anyway, what'll happen is this spirit of accusation, what Satan's gonna do is he tries to get us to accuse God. And the big way is that we accuse God is is just areas of unbelief. And so that and it wears us down. Not necessarily any, not any, but no. But I, I'm sure every one of us in this room at points in time have accused God in some way, shape, or form. And uh, I know I have. You know, just God, you're not. You know, you know, you're just not. I just don't feel you, God. You're just not with me. Facts don't line up, God. That's accusation. So how Satan's going to do, he's the accuser. Okay? Well, let's see, let's see another thing to what he, you know, how he operates in accusation is, go with me to Job chapter 1, verse 6. Well, in Revelation 12, 10, what Machen just read, he's the accuser of the what? Do you remember what I said, Machen? So he is the accuser of the brethren. Okay? And here's, here's a really crazy one. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth. 
He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. So, guess what God's doing? What's going on here with God? What's God doing? No, he's not, he's not baiting. No, God don't bait Satan. He's declaring truth over Job. He's declaring truth. God, Jesus, is our intercessor. That's what he's doing. He's interceding for Job. Watch this. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him in his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hands and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Curse you. He's, 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 he's accusing Job before God. He will do that with us. God, Jesus, is particularly, he's the great high priest of our confession. Jesus declares truth over us, and here's the reality: is is that what uh, um, what Satan will do is bring accusations against us. Now, here's the important thing you catch on this. Uh, by the way, let me back up on this. God is not baiting Satan. Put, he's not putting Job dangling Job out there. I want y'all to notice this statement here where in verse 8, the Lord said to Satan, have you cons-? in English it says, have you considered my servant Job? Um, God accuses Satan here. And he literally, is say, literally in the Hebrew it reads, I'm not exaggerating it at all. He says, have you set your, have you set your heart on my servant Job? Because he says, where have you been? Where have you come from? And what did he say? Now, where did that, where, where did that, what is that phrase reference to? New Testament passage that this passage comes from. Yeah, 1 Peter 5 8, where Satan is like a roaming, roaming lion seeking someone to what? So God's saying, What are you doing? You're roaming around, the, paraphrase is, you're roaming around on the earth looking for someone to devour. And you've set your heart on my servant Job. And he did. And there were at least three major legal rights in Job's life. Doorways that opens, opened doorways up for Job, for Satan to destroy him. Not destroy, but bring destruction into his, to his life. His kids are in incest, fear. That which I have feared has come upon me. And the big one was self-righteousness. Later on in Job, I think it's 28, I think it, I can't remember, I apologize. He says, I will not turn loose of my righteousness. Well, y'all, last time I checked, the book of Isaiah tells us our, our righteousness is what? It's filthy rags. The worst thing you can ever do is try to stand on your righteousness in spiritual warfare. It's not about us being right. It's about Jesus being our rightness. That's our confidence. Job, his doing everything right was his confidence. He, that's, it's, he's dead meat. And that's why you see in the book, of, the end of the chapter, the end of the book, that Job repents. He's undeclared that which I have not seen. And that's why the book of James in the New Testament describes God's response to Job is merciful and compassionate. But if you read it from a spiritual warfare standpoint, where, where you read it from a standpoint where it looks like God's just putting Job out there for Satan to jack him, and you see his family killed, that's not merciful, that's not compassion. But God, what? The, the New Testament viewpoint of what happened was God was merciful. When you get mercy is when you blow it. Compassionate is when you're you know, he's really trying to help him. Well, that's what God was toward Job. And so anyway, this spiritual warfare thing here where Satan is accusing Job. And notice what happened to him. And you can tell us where the destruction came from. Because what God says to Satan says, what, it, what in the last verse it says, uh, not in the last verse, but in verse 12. Behold, all that he has is what? In your power. And that word, 
power there literally means hand. So Satan had him in his Job in his hand. And so it gets expressed. So anyway, so Satan brings accusation. Um, now, y'all, here's where you need to learn accusation. The angle from this standpoint. First off is, whenever you sense accusations in your heart popping up in relationship to who God is, recognize in who, who He is and what He does. God is good. There is no variation or shifting shadow. He does not vary from doing good. James 1.17 he gives what? Life and what? Life abundantly. I mean, every funeral in Scripture that we see Jesus came in, in contact with, He raised the person from the dead. He's the worst. He'd be the worst funeral director around. Well, it'd be the best, but it won't be not maybe be buried. Because that was His characteristic. So if you hear that, feel that, recognize that is, that is probably the spirit of Antichrist trying to wear you down to get you to accuse God. Second thing is, if you start to sense and feel accusations against yourself, it's, it's coming one of two places. One is, it's happening in the spiritual realm. Either in one of three places, to be honest with you. One, in heaven. What's the use? You know, what's the use? And, you know, I just, I, I just might as well quit. You know, stuff like that. Give up. Satan's trying to accuse you before God. You know. Here's one. Here's one that uh, I really, really encourage you to never do in the uh, in fact, we'll talk about this in a few minutes in another stream of the scheme of the devil. Don't ever give Satan a price tag. Don't ever give him a price. It's like this. I hear people pray this prayer. This is all I can take. This is the last straw. You done drew a line in the sand. That's what death guarantee you. What's going to happen? You're going to have it again. Because guess what? He just heard you say that. And he is going to give that to you. So you quit. Uh, that's the last, you know, I, I can't take any more of that. Don't ever say stuff like that. You just gave a price for, for of temptation for you to receive. And one, again, we're going to talk about temptation here in a few minutes. In fact, I really feel like the Lord is telling us to spend some time there tonight. So, so, accusation against ourselves. Here's another one that's interesting. Go to James chapter 5, verse 9, and uh, you'll see another type of accusation that occurs. Do not complain or have against one another so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. Do not complain against one another. Accuse. So you start complaining against somebody, guess what? You get the opportunity. So that you yourselves would not be judged. I can't believe Josh is doing that. In fact, that's what, complaining when somebody wrongs you is one of the very things, the ways that can chain you to a situation. Complaining. It's one of the six sins against. So... So accusation against God, you know, accuse, accusation against ourselves, or the accusation against the brother. And here's the interesting thing. I, it's really kind of interesting is that, that you could, in the spiritual realm, you could take, you could take uh, John and Deanne, put them in this back room back here in the kitchen, and have them start complaining about about Josh and Josh and Josh can't hear it and he can he could feel it in the spirit. What about when we think negative thoughts towards someone? 
Is it the same deal? That is in, uh, you can see that in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, where it says, verse 3, I think it is, Do not be hasty to bring up a matter in word or thought in the presence of a messenger of God. So you say your thoughts can get you in trouble just as much as your words that are spoken. So, now, you know, I will tell you this. The, the level of spiritual warfare that you enter into is determines the level these kind of things will make having an effect in your lives. Um, like how I always picture it is, it's like here's a, here's here's the surface of the water, and if you got a a submarine that's got cracks in the hull, you know if it's on the surface, the cracks are not being exposed. You can get by with you can get by with junk. Let the submarine dive. The deeper it goes, the deeper small things can become deadly. So when you're dealing with intense spiritual warfare, you know, like there's a couple of times in my life that I, I like there was some, one time I, I entered in, I was in dealing with some very stout, demonic activity with another pastor, a spirit of a false prophet, and I started making judgments and accusations against him where I did not have the authority to do. And it opened up uh, that very night that I did that. It opened up a doorway that my daughter ended up with a viral meningitis. And the time, as soon as I repented of it, the very next day, I, the day that, that it manifests, I'm carrying in the doctor in my arms. She's hurting so bad. I realize what we carry the doctor, and he says, it's meningitis, don't know whether it's bacterial or viral. You know, we have to wait, you know, the whole deal, and so we're going to send you home. You know, and I mean, I'm like, do you have, I mean, you know, I mean, she's hurting really, really bad and sick and and uh, so we carry her home and said, bring her back in two or three hours and we'll test her again and we'll be able to tell because it'll, blood test will, will, blood count will make us, it was at a level that has this, it'll tell one thing or the other. So we carried her back, you know, and he said, it's viral, can't, can't do anything for it, just got to treat the symptoms. Well, I started, when in between those times, I started repenting. This God's on his truth. The next morning, I carry her back to the same doctor, whereas the day before, I carried her in my arms. That next morning, I carry her in the doctor. I'm holding her by the hand. We come into the doctor's office. And I don't know why she did it, but in the waiting room, I got there before you know, the, the, any of us got there. And she jumps up off on the, the chairs and starts running around the chairs around the room all around. And I, I go in and I said, yeah, I just wanted to show you all something. In 24 hours, oh, you don't cover that quick from my house meningitis. The doorway that I opened was a very intense spiritual warfare and it had very negative effects on my family. How do you expose a false teaching? Because God wants you to do that. Oh, he does? But how do you do that? Does without... he, he called me to expose false teaching? No. He didn't cause me to false teaching. The only time I can expose false teaching is when I have authority in that some person's life to deal with that. That's the very trick of Satan that Satan wants me to do. We've talked about this a number of times. I, when I, to get me to judge into a situation where I do not have authority, is that's called butt kicking material, and that's what I did. I don't play that. I don't. That's why I, I get really sensitive about hearing, like on the internet, hearing people start making accusations. You know, you and I talked about it a number of times about this or that. I, I, I do not want to go there. I do not have the authority to go there. Romans chapter 14 says, Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands and falls. So, if this pastor over here, Joe Blows over here, and he says something, and I, don't, I don't have any authority in his life. I, I open myself up to a lot of 
stuff that I don't want if I start judging him. Dangerous stuff. So if you were their friend. That's a whole other issue. But then you're, you're, your whole deal is you're trying to win your brother. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you're not judging them. You're judging what's coming out of their mouth. A specific thing, what they're saying. Hey, bro, do you realize what you just said? You know, so that 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 would be the thing. And so, you know, you, you make sure you, that you're not making judge, you're not judging the person, you're judging the action. So, big difference. I don't have a right to make a ju- I don't have a right to judge, make judgments on another person's character. There's only one judge and lawgiver. It's not God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and Rick. You know, last time I checked, there's not four seats up there. You know, it's just one. <laughs> you know? So you wouldn't even say, you're a false teacher. You would say, do well, you understand what you just said? I would say the latter. I'd yeah. say, in the first, say in that first one. Yeah. Uh, I would, when you said it, I, I could feel it inside my gut. Some people might see that mistake. As spiritual warfare. What do, you, what do you mean? To condemn, you know, whatever it is you see is really false. And that's not. No, it's spiritual warfare. <laughs> on the wrong side. Like on the wrong side. Judge not lest you be judged. In the same way you judge, you will be judged. And also you have to realize, too, is that trying to... Or, or I'll just use these terms, accusing someone of being a false teacher, that's pretty big. Because ain't nobody got it wrong. If, if you're trying to expose a false teacher, have you taught everything yourself right? <laughs> that is so true, Mike. So so you've got to be real careful about being the, the Rambo, Christian Rambo, you know, out there trying to, trying to expose all this stuff. Because most likely you don't have it all right either, <laughs> which means you're you're basically accusing them of the same thing you're doing. So, so you got to be real careful. God allowed me to have an event that occurred with my dad that really taught me what, what Mike's talking about. I was uh, when I was working with in Time Saver Food Stores, you know, I came up from the bottom. I mean, I I, I began as a cutting weeds beside the stores. And, you know, to graduated to, to, uh, to scraping paint, to sweeping spider webs off the fronts of the buildings. And I graduated to being a cashier. Then I graduated to being a uh, assistant manager. Then I graduated to be a store manager. Then I graduated to be a supervisor over a group of stores. Well, when I was a supervisor of a group of stores, there was there was another lady who was supervisor over a group of stores. And we had, you know, had supervisors over these groups of stores. Well, I didn't like what she was doing. So one morning, you know, you know I'd see Dad, you know, a lot of times before, you know, um, we would go to go to work. You know, our, both Dad and I lived in the same town from the main office. And the, the main office was like 50 miles away from where Dad and I lived. So anyway, sometimes I'd see him. So, this one particular morning, I start. I got you know my high horse, horse in relationship to this other supervisor. So I start just telling Dad all the things she was doing wrong. So, so anyway, so I, I you know I got in my car and I went went down to and uh, and some of my stores were like in this out, you know, way away from all the other, the main office and the other stores. So I'm uh, over there, at one, of, one of my those stores in that other town. And uh, all of a sudden, Dad pulls up, and I'm going, that's interesting. What's he doing here? So he gets out of, he gets out of the car, and he says, he says, come here. And he starts walking through this store that I'm overseeing, you know, one of my stores. And he's, I mean, he goes over it with a fine tooth cone. I mean, he picks it apart. And, and I don't mean like nice and sweet either. You know, and he just 
What is this here? What, you, what is this? You know, what do you I mean, he's just, and over here, what about this? You know, I mean, he just went through it. He just butchered it. I mean, just picked the whole place apart. And then he gets ready. He starts walking back in the car, and he goes, he says, now get these things right. Now, whenever you, how did he say it? He says, whenever you think you're good enough to judge somebody else, you better make sure your stuff's right. And he got in the car and left, and I'm going, oh. And that's what happens in the spiritual realm with us. Exactly what Mike said. Oh, I'm going to judge this guy for being a false teacher. So guess what? Every area in my life that anything that I ever said about God or theology, guess what? Gets, gets judged. And so guess what? If I judge this guy for messing up, then guess what? I judge him for being a false teacher about something he said wrong. Guess what? This particular area over here. So like Mike said, you know, just if you if you make that judgment, just just make sure that you're totally 100 percent right in everything that you know. It, it almost sounds like to me you might as well just be quiet and don't think at all, really, because like what Mike was saying, like don't judge a false teacher. But to me, I feel like we uh, like can judge, not make a judgment. But like if it's something that is that is obviously false, like this new age religion type stuff. Like, and we know it doesn't align with the truth, and we know what the truth is, and we don't align with that. Like, still don't have the right to judge. You're always judging what's said. I think there's also a difference between, okay, that what they're saying that I don't, you know, I, I don't agree with that, or that I don't see that in scripture. But then, but then to say. They're ridiculous. They should not be a pastor. They're dumb. That that's where you get into the the bad. That's where you get into the dangerous section. Does that make sense? You said something really important. Well, you make sure not going to say anything. Well, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, yeah. able to bridle his whole body as well. Yeah. And it does say in the book of Proverbs, even a fool. When he keeps his mouth shut, seems wise. So, I, you know, there's a lot of times. That's why it says in the book of James, it says, Jealousy and selfish ambition are. Do not speak and so lie against the truth. So, in other words, uh, just keep your mouth shut. Sometimes it's best. <laughs> God says, uh, shh. So, yeah, that is. But then, do you make the judge judge the things that are being said within the sphere of authority that you have in relationship to what you have and be careful how you speak at other places. Yeah, yeah. The, the couple that I told you about that was going into the, to get, get baptized into Mormonism, when I met with them, you know, I did not pick apart what Mormons said. That was not true. What I did with them was I speak, spoke the truth. And the truth is what enabled them to set up free. I didn't make accusations against the Mormons. I just made accu- I just I just spoke the truth. And when those Mormons came face to face, I just declared the truth. And that's when the couple starts really going, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute, yeah. And so yeah. In regard to not speaking, um, I have a little saying on my wall that says uh, just love people. I'll take care of the rest later. And then signs God. <laughs> but of course, that's not. I'll be honest with y'all. I, you think about this. I think we, the body of Christ, I'm throwing me in this. We in the body of Christ are considered by the world as some of the most obnoxious people. Because we're high and mighty, we think we're going to correct the world and get the world straight. Well, y'all, we're to be salt and light. But how we become salt and light is just love and speaking and speaking about the cross, you know. And that's why you, that's that's here. That's that be my, you know. So anyway, I do believe there's a fine line of being afraid and just submitting to keep your mouth shut, rather than to correct somebody out of love and know when to do it. Like, 
you, like you said, I'm not going to say, oh, this person's a liar. They or this and that. I'm going to just start saying all kinds of nasty things, but I am going to say, do you realize that Scripture says this? And that is not aligning up at all with that. And I just want you to know that. Now, if I was scared to say anything, then I'm not doing them a justice. Of, right. You know? Like, it, I'm not going to do it out of hatred towards that person. I would do it out of love because I felt the need to say it. Yeah, and I agree with you 100%. And the, the thing that I do want to say, though, there's a time for me to, to that I can speak to correct somebody, and there's a time to just, okay, now's not the time. I don't know the verse, but it's called um, the one that be slow to, slow to speak. Do you know the verse? Help me out. James chapter 1. Yeah, verse 19, my beloved brethren, but everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. We try, try to do this here, but also we really try to do it in dwelling place. When I was an elder in dwelling place, just our mindset was that past scripture says that one just spoken, Jesus says that which is spoken in the room will be shouted from the rooftops. My heart is that whatever I would say in the inner room of a meeting would be the same thing that I would speak out. You know, the only time I you know, would not want to speak, I could felt free to speak something there, speak out as if I'm talking about something that how that we can help that person and what they're dealing with. You know, but not from a standpoint of, can you believe what Allison is doing. He says pretty strong things, but he but he's God. <laughs> and God the Father just did say all judgment has been given to me. And so uh, I just you know, not alongside like I said earlier. Let's go to let's go to another one. Um, go with me to uh, John chapter sixteen, verse thirty three. So we're dealing with Satan tries to accuse he tries to deceive. Okay. John 16, 11. Did you know what John 16, 11 does say? Yeah, the ruler of this world has been judged. So literally everything that Jesus is doing is, is bringing to light everything that where Satan is bringing destruction. And he's going to be judged. He's, he's judged. Okay. So but notice what Jesus calls Satan, the ruler of this world. Now look at John 16, 33. In this world, you will have what? Tribulations. So, so what we're dealing with, deception, deceiver, accusation. I'm going I'm to I'm use a word here in scripture right now. Adversities of, of the world. Adversities of the world. And what we're seeing here in relationship to to the world, in this world you will have what? Tribulation means to squeeze, to, to pressure, make narrow. To be tribulated is a facet of the world. From who? Satan. Satan wants to manipulate the circumstances and situations in the world to cause you tribulations. I went out last Friday morning with Ryan Carlisle into his uh, into their into the class out at the Eagle's Nest Regeneration, and there was a guy, a really precious man of God, in there. You know, one of the guys in the program, and he starts talking about how God takes things from you. You know, and Stuff like that, you know, stuff, you know, like, well, you know, stuff, he just, he gets hard and he, he put, he sifts you and, and then makes things hard. And I go, ah, I said, no, that's not the taker. It's not the taker. He's the giver of life. He's a giver. He's not a taker. And I said, what goes on? But you got to realize this, y'all. Is that what happens is 
So here we are. And uh, you like that, Mage? So we're 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 trying to head into the likeness of heaven and the likeness of God in the spirit. The two of y'all, but when we're born into this world, we're 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 fleshly. And so there's facets of our being that are fleshly and so and so it's connected the flesh is connected to the world. So when I start trying to draw closer to God, the flesh is trying to draw me into the world. The spirit is trying to draw is is I say drawing. He's he's calling you into the into the heavenlies, okay? So he's calling you here. You, the world is connected to our flesh, okay? What is the main force of the flesh? I'm chasing rabbits right now, by the way. What's the main force of the flesh? Lust. First Peter two eleven. Abstain from fleshly lust which wage war against the soul. So what happens is, is the lust of our flesh wages war against our soul. And the Greek word for lust means what, y'all? Upon the mind with force. So the flesh is trying to dominate you. The spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, self. It's freedom. But the flesh is trying to dominate. So when you walk in toward toward God in the Spirit, you know what the Scripture says that you're doing to the flesh? In Romans chapter 8, verse 14, when you're living to the Spirit, what is it doing to the flesh? Huh? You're dying. It says, it talks about putting... If you live to the Spirit, you're putting to death the deeds of the flesh. So, so you got something in you that's fleshly. And you start walking toward the Spirit. The flesh is going, No! That's right. Oh, I don't want to die! <laughs> what is it? What are the Wizard of Oz? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it flashes, and you're going, oh, look what you're taking from me, God. And God's going, I'm not taking it. Oh, it hurts. Yeah, the flesh is dying. That old self is dying because you're living to the Spirit. So everybody goes, well, God's, God's a taker. He's hurt. That's painful. No, it's not. He's painful. It's our what? Flesh. And notice in that John sixteen thirty three says, it says, In me you will have what? In that verse. Peace. In the world you will have what? So literally what it's saying, literally in the Greek is, anything in you that's attached to God is what? Anything attached to the world will get... <laughs> you get tribulated. So don't go... Well, look what God's doing to me. No. No. It's just just part of the deal of growing and living to the Spirit. I heard somebody say one time that the problem with a living sacrifice is it keeps trying to crawl off the altar. Yeah. That's true. So, so tribulation, adversities of this world. A tribulation, another one, y'all, is, is a part of here is persecution. That's, that's a facet of the world. Jesus warned us in John 15, the world hates you as it hated me. The world's going to persecute. So, so, what I'm trying to say is, in you know, the situations and circumstances of the world, Satan is trying to manipulate to try to distract and distort you. 
and hinder you from, from living to the Spirit. Let's me to John, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, verse 1 of chapter 4. And Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones become bread. Satan is the what? Tempter. What do that mean? What do that mean? This word, the root Greek word for that, I don't know if I'm trying to tell you, pyros, pyrosmos, or pyrozo is the word, the verb and noun for temptation or tempter. Literally, the root word of it means to puncture, to pass through. In fact, go with me to the, the, the book of Luke and uh, chapter 22. Watch this in uh, verse 39 and 40 of chapter 22. It means to puncture, to pass through, to enter into is what temptation means. So if I'm going to the bathroom, I've got to go through the door. That would be, I would be being tempted. I would have come into temptation to go through the door. So watch this in verse 39 and 40. I'll just read it real quick. He came out and proceeded, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciple also followed him. When he arrived at that place, he said to them, watch this, pray that you may not enter into temptation. That's interesting, the Greek words there that line up. With the first one is a word that means to literally come into. And, and this interesting that it it has a preposition on its own, meaning into, temptation, which means to pass into, pass through, pass into, you've entered into it. So, and so what Jesus is tell, warning them, there's a doorway here you don't want to enter. So pray that you may not enter in. See, see, here's a really important thing to catch here. Um, Satan is the tempter, and he wants to put before you doorways that when you pass through, Mitch, how would I do this? I don't know. When you pass into it, sin waits for you on the backside. You enter into it. So he's trying to create the environment to draw you into this. See, prayerlessness, or what Jesus is saying here, creates an environment for you and I to be what? Tempted. So many times we think that we're, you know, man, this temptation's hard. Well, just because there's an environment going on that's drawing you, that you need, you need to pray to stand. So, but they're separate, but are they two in one? If you enter into the doorway of temptation, have you sinned? Yeah. Well, let's go, go, to, go, to James, go to James chapter 1. It tells you just what you just said. If you've in, what, hear what you just said. If you enter into the doorway of temptation, you have sinned. James chapter 1, verse, verse uh, 13. Okay, notice what it says here. Let no one say, when he's tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. He himself does not tempt anyone. Okay, we gotta we have to deal with that, y'all, because there's a problem there. He himself does not tempt anyone. You do realize in in uh, Hebrews chapter eleven, verse seventeen, it says that God tempted Abraham when he had him offer up Isaac. But what you're seeing here is that God does not tempt anyone to what? Sin. To faith. The doorway that God had for 
Abraham to pass into was faith. The Satan's put before us the doorway of sin. Watch this. He himself does not tempt anyone. Verse 14. If anyone is tempted, tempted, okay, in other words, it's had its fullness, when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. When lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So temptation, there's a temptation. What draws you through it is what? Lust. And when lust has drawn us through the door, that's what you were saying, you have entered into sin, and sin brings forth death. Cynthia just said, lead us not into temptation. Do you realize what that passage of Scripture is saying? What that passage of Scripture is talking about spiritual warfare in the courtroom of heaven. Lead us not into temptation. We can put ourselves before doorways of temptations that we were not designed to deal with. Because God... It does say, go with me in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, there is no temptation that is not common to man. But then that passage just says, go, go to it, turn to it, it's very crucial with this. I told, I told the interns just a couple of days ago, just a couple of times, I said, I'm going to share something to you, and now I'm free. So, you know, I've, I've showed it to you, and life and death's on your on your table right now. No temptation is overtaking you, which is not common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Now, I've heard people say, "There's nothing comes across, nothing comes across in our life that does not come across God's God's desk." That is not true, because this is only talking about what. Temptation. Now, there's temptations, there's tribulation, there's wildernesses, there's persecution. There's many other adverse, there's other types of adversities. This is talking about temptation, y'all. And he says, God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. Because what he's saying there, y'all, when a temptation comes along... Y'all, it can be strong enough to pull you, suck you right into it. In fact, you feel like it, like that's the doorway that's coming in. All of a sudden, there's this massive vacuum trying to pull you into that door. That's that's what the temptation is doing. It's trying to draw you into it. And sometime, and so God, it says in this passage, that God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. So you will, if there's a temptation, you will have the strength to not be sucked through the door. And if they're, if you, he's trying to draw you through the door, he's saying there's a window. Okay? You with me so far? Because I'm about to take a turn. Sometime the escape to the temptation is not be in front of the door. God's warned us about it ahead of time. Cynthia just said one. Lead us not into temptation. Well, go to go to Matthew. Go to Matthew six. Cynthia quoted that. Well, what in the world was it saying? What was Jesus saying when he said that? So, so Cynthia quoted that verse thirteen. Well, verse twelve. Last time I checked, 12 is the number before 13, right? Well, verse 12 says, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Okay. That's talking about what? Huh? Forgiveness. Look at verse 14, the very verse after verse 13. If you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. So verse 12 is about what? Verse 14 is about what? 
then that tells us that verse 13 is about what? Why is it about temptation? Because it's about what? It's about forgiveness. So if I have unforgiveness, guess what I'm going to get? Tempted. Other things. Whatever. I'm going to show you some more, so I'm not... God won't allow us to be tempted more than what we can handle. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond more than Right, but before that, you said we can put ourselves in front of doorways. Do you remember what you said? Well, he will, we can put ourselves in front of doorways we were never created to be, in which God had nothing about, and there's no strength to stand, and there's no door, there's no exit. Well, he, and he's told us the escape is before you get there. Let's go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. Look at some of these doorways that you can open up in relationship to temptation. We're talking about spiritual warfare, okay, y'all? This is, this is spiritual warfare 101. You don't want to get... In, I'll say this to y'all. Probably the number one stronghold that I ever deal with when I'm casting demons out of people is unforgiveness. Sometimes another unforgiveness somewhere is in there. It's probably in there a lot. Uh, verse 9. Notice where the escape is. But those who want to get rich, what? So guess what? We're at the doorway. Right here. Yeah, the, the desire to get rich. But the doorway's in the Scripture. It doesn't say you may fall into temptation. It is, it is a verb form that means if I drop this, it's going to fall. So if I have a desire to get rich, the careful place you got to word it right there is, you, is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Oh, I see the tree is good. It's good for food. It's good to make one wise. See, what God, where the reality is, is God is our, what? He's our riches. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what? All these things shall be added to you. First Timothy six nineteen. Instruct those who are rich in this world not to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. So the trap is, is that, you start looking, okay, I want to try to be successful and be rich. That's dead meat. You're going to fall into temptation. There will be temptation right there. The desire, the thing is where it's got at is, I'm it. You have me. You'll have what? Yeah, you'll have it. And so that's the whole, that's the whole trap, fine line in it. Well, how do I... Come close to you and or have 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 to inherit eternal life. Jesus and said, he said give everything away. Give everything away and follow me. But he didn't mean like his possessions. He his did. Possessions and family and everything and then following. But like, I'm in today's world. We can give everything up but not. Well, see, the reason why Jesus did that with the rich young ruler is because if you'll notice, he said, what commandments can I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus starts listing stuff off. And if you'll notice what Jesus, he skipped over, and one thing he did not mention, in fact, the very first thing he did not mention was the very first commandment of the law. You shall have no other what? God's before me. Because why? His riches were, was his God. So anytime you entertain thoughts that riches is the supplier of your needs, that's what? That's your saying that you're God. So, and so anyway. So, so anyway, the desire to get rich is the doorway. Is is it, you're going to be gone through the door. You're going to be tempted in some way, shape, or form. We go to First Corinthians chapter seven. This is talking about marriage couples. Verse five. So, oh man, sorry, eight oh six. We're going to have to probably put a pause on it. 
Stop depriving one another except for agreement for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer. Come back, come together again so that Satan will not, guess what? Tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So in other words, one of the, one of the doorways to, to now allow sexual immorality to enter into a relationship between a husband and wife in a, in a marriage relationship is for, for the husband and wife to play the game of uh, keeping themselves from one another. It will open a doorway to temptation. So there's there's things that what can happen is it puts us before it puts us in the door. It is, it's one more. Let's go to Galatians chapter six. Six one. Brethren, if anyone is caught in a trespass, you are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each looking to yourself, so that you will not be what? Tempted. Periodically, I get invited to get invited into situations and circumstances where sexual immorality is an issue. And every time I deal with that, before I go there to deal with somebody, first off, I want to know that I'm in a, I've got an attitude of gentleness toward them. But also, I want to. Anyone? Notice how it says. Uh, Looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. And I'll, I'll make sure that I deal with whatever's in my heart in relationship to anything that's in that category of stuff. Because if I, if I start to deal with this person about that issue, then, and I'm confronting them about this issue, guess, guess what? I'm going to be what? Tempted in relationship to the same issue that I'm helping this quote helping this person with. I have opened the doorway for myself. And now here's the crazy thing about it is it may not have been a doorway in my life. Until then, until I operated toward this person, then all of a sudden Satan goes, Oh, I'm glad you did that. Here we go. So I mean, um I, I could show you some others like real quick, uh you know, where you go, I'll never do that. There's a, there's a temptation. It'll be there. You're going to be tempted to what? Do that. I'll never forget Paul and I. But child and Bud, my brother and his wife, you know, their kids. There were some things that how they raised their kids. And Paul, before Paul and I had kids, we were really experts on Having kids. <laughs> so, and I remember, you know, in my heart, you know, I, uh, yeah, I can't believe Bud and Charl are doing this with Trey and Brooke. I, yeah, I'd never do that. <laughs> and so, guess what? <laughs> is, is it good to say, by the grace of God, I will? Not do this. Instead of putting the law on yourself, you kind of buffer it. What leads you into salvation? Vows or oaths? Mm-hmm. What leads you into salvation? I'm quoting. I'm cutting the front side of a verse. Oh. Unto salvation. Something is made unto salvation. Confession is made unto salvation. What's confession mean? Speak the same thing. So saying, I'll never do this, I'm just, I'm putting the weight on myself to fulfill the oath or vow. But what I want to do is declare the truth of God's word. That's just not who I am. Your word says that I'm more than a conqueror. Your word says that I'm holy. Oh, okay. Power, the the place of temptation comes on the word. See, if I say, see, see, you get... Well, and we're going to look at this. This is one of the next things we we're going to go to. When you make an oath or a vow, it creates a spiritual debt. When you say, I'm going to, or even I say, by the grace of God, I will do this. Okay? You can say that that way. What, what's going to happen is the source of that 
oath or vow is going to be tested. Okay, so if I say that I'm not going to do it, the strength to fulfill that is going to come out of me, and that's where the temptation is going to be, and it's going to try to test, Satan's going to test the limits on that. But if I'm confessing the Word of God, the Word of God gets tested. Ooh, well, the Word of God is unlimited power. In fact, it's the sword of the Spirit. So, so the goal is to confess. It's the power of confession. That's why sometimes we've been talking together in your relationship with Dan. Okay? We go, Dan, yeah, I always love you. I won't never such and such do that. No, John, don't go there. You know, your confession is, ah, Dan, my destiny is to love you as Christ loved the church. And, and to give himself up for you. That's my destiny. So what? Guess what? That's the word of God. That's the promise of God. So that's what's going to be tested. That's where the resource is going to come. So it's like Satan seeks to straw through you into the Word of God. So guess what? What's getting drawn on is the Word of God into your life. So the reason why I'm talking about this stuff tonight, I really wanted to go through these things. And we'll finish this thing up on temptation next week, and it'll get even deeper in this, Bill. Because sometimes you're dealing with spiritual warfare and things where doorways are in, in simple confessions, simple... Judgment, simple accusations, passions. I mean, you think about it. The desire to get rich, you will fall into temptation and suffer many pains. That's what it says. Yeah, you're going to suffer. So you go, what is going on? And it very well may be the very simple thing is to go, oh, Lord, forgive me for my desire to get rich. Rather than you, believing if I have you, that I have riches. So, so it could be a very well simple thing. And so, you know, we're trying to cast out spirits here and there, but it just really may be something simple like that. And that's why I'm trying to go into details of this. Some of the most powerful spiritual warfare you can stuff you can do is just understand the Word of God and how to operate in it. So, and how Satan's coming at you. So anyway.